Welcome to our lecture on Roman art. And first, we'll take a look at the geography we're going to be looking at. And this is present day Rome. Of course, we're going to be talking about this in Survey 2 when we look at the Italian Renaissance. But Rome is definitely a center part, a centerpiece of the production of art. And this is what Rome looks like back during 117 AD. And we can see that it is stretched throughout Europe and as well as North Africa and the Middle East. So way back during the monarchy and republic, dating back from 753 BC, we see that ancient Rome was ruled by kings. In the 6th century, though, we begin a republic with a senate. And these are led by older individuals. We think of older individuals as very wise. And what mattered really the most, and this was a multicultural society, what mattered the most was that if you were a Roman citizen or not. However, Julius Caesar becomes dictator in 48 BC. And of course, his famous love affair with Cleopatra. Caesar's going to be assassinated on March 15th, 44 BC at the Theater of Pompeii. This is the Senate floor. And so we also call this day the Ides of March. And we have a great painting of the scene as the senators are leaving the murder scene. And this is what the Theater of Pompeii looks like today. Unfortunately, though, Caesar's death is going to mark the end of the Roman Republic. And civil war breaks out, and you can see there are six different factions that are trying to gain control of the Roman Empire. But in 27 BC, Caesar's nephew Octavian rises to power, and he's going to establish peace, and he's going to be given the name Augustus. And here we have the golden age of Rome beginning. So this marks the beginning also of the early empire. And our very first artwork we're going to look at is the Augustus of Prima Porta. And this, of course, is an amazing image. This is very much done in the Greek style, like the spear bearer that we see at the right. We call it Doriferous. And we have that Greek ideal. And that's what Augustus wants to bring back to Rome, is this golden age that we saw during the classical period in Greece. So this sculpture at the right was found in the home of Augustus's wife, Livia, in the city of Prima Porta. So that's where the title of the sculpture comes from. Just like other Greek sculptures though, this would have been done in bronze originally. And then many, many copies were going to be created and put throughout the Roman Republic. The idea that we don't have TVs, we don't have photographs, we didn't know what the ruler looked like. And so Augustus made sure that he was seen everywhere by his constituents. So this work is political propaganda. The sculpture also shows an idealized version of Augustus, someone who is young, who is handsome, who is athletic, and definitely godlike. And he is related to the gods just by looking at the sculpture itself. On the breastplate alone, we have the god of the sky and the goddess of the earth. Down at his foot, we have also Cupid, which is the son of Venus. Now, Augustus can trace his ancestry back to Aeneas, and he also claimed to be the son of Venus. So I guess that makes Cupid Augustus's nephew. 
And where else would a sculpture like this be? But of course, at Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the Arapacus, which is one of the most important monuments that we see in Augustine, Rome. And the name itself translates into the Altar of Peace. Augustus was the first emperor of Rome to establish the Pax Romana which is known as the Roman peace. And this is the event that prompted the building of this altar. And we can see here in the image at the right, this is the new building that it's in that was constructed by Richard Meyer, the famous modernist architect. And it really plays to the sensibility of this structure. When we look at the Arapacus and what Augustus does to Rome, he arrives and it's a city of brick, and when he leaves, it is a city of marble. And we see this transition here to this new type of contemporary architecture. And I think the Arapacus definitely stands out in this new type of environment. The work itself had been lost for centuries, and another building was built on top of the base the pieces started becoming discovered in the 1700s, a lot of them in the early 20th century, and the person who reconstructed this was Mussolini himself, just prior to World War II. The area around the altar, and the altar is in the center, but the perimeter around is called the precinct. The top register shows a processional of priests and members of Augustus's family. We even think one of the figures there is Augustus himself. The bottom register shows 50 varieties of plants, along with some other cool animals, such as birds, lizards, and frogs. Other friezes illustrate stories of the founding of Rome. And I will caution you that art historians have huge debates over who these individuals are, and nothing is for sure. There are people who argue that the woman in the center here is Venus. Others argue she is more of a Mother Earth type of figure. We don't know who the allegorical figures are on either side of her. The small children have been related to Romulus and Remus. Uh, a, an abundance of fruit uh, sits on her lap and we have some imagery of animals below her. So it is a very confusing image, but something that is very, very highly rendered. I mean, this is a type of relief called high relief, and it's definitely seen during the Roman Empire. We do not see it very much in Greece, though. We see low relief there. And so here are a few of the individuals that we've been able to identify from the precinct. And just like how Greek architecture would have been painted, the Arapacus would have been painted as well, very gaudy colors. And I think it would definitely stand out. Keep in mind though, that Augustus is also Pontificate Maximus. He is the high priest. So he is not only leading the Senate in Rome, he is also leading the religion of Rome. So way back in the early chapters of the course, we talked about the post and lentil system and how important it was to the creation of architecture. We saw this in the Neolithic period. We saw it in Greece. And in Rome, what happens is we have a transformation in architecture. Make sure that you know that the Romans invented the arch. And the arch is something that revolutionizes architecture. It makes a huge impact from this point forward. And the Pont du Gard, which is over the Nîmes River in France, is the first time we use arches in a major building project. 
So with the post and lintel system, you're looking at about a span of maybe 40 feet in diameter. Here, all of a sudden, arches can give us 60 feet diameter or 80 feet diameter. We'll look at the Pantheon in a few moments, and that is 140 feet across. Arches are able to create these in huge spaces of uninterrupted space, and that's why it's so important. So the Romans invent the arch. This is the first time we see arches in a major building project, and the project itself is incredibly important. This is not only a bridge, but it is an aqueduct. And we'll take a look at the aqueduct part in just a moment. But of course, visually stunning as well. It's about 180 feet in height and over 800 feet across. It is enough to supply 100 gallons of water for every person in the city of Nîmes. It was built in only five years, and only the aqueduct level, that very top level, used mortar. Everything else held together by gravity. And here's the base level here. And the aqueduct level. So this is the only part that had mortar. This is what would transport the water to where it was needed, and this is why the Romans are so important for us. It is because they can traverse nature. It is man's battle versus nature. And when we see the Middle East, our villages crop up between the Tigris and the Euphrates. When we look at Egypt, civilization emerges along the Nile. It's important that we have a water source. We have to live by water. All of a sudden now, the Romans have invented something that can take 20 or 30 water 20 or 30 miles from its source and deliver it to the city that needs it. No longer do we have to live by a water source. We can bring the water to us. So it is a huge advancement in civilization here. The way the arch is made up is through a level of these wedge-shaped blocks. These are called voussoirs. And the last stone to go into place that holds the arch together is called the keystone. And we're going to talk more about arches in the later classes because this allows us to build not only uninterrupted spaces, but super tall buildings, it's going to create the naves of churches in the Gothic Age, all sorts of things. So we will definitely return to the arch in, in a little bit. We're going to move on to the Flavian dynasty, and we're looking primarily at the gentleman at the left, the Emperor Vespasian. And he was the one who was responsible for building the Colosseum, probably the most recognizable of all Roman landmarks. And, of course, here's where we have the idea of the gladiators fighting one another. But we really need to look at the architectural accomplishment this building was. When we look back at how theaters were during the time of the Greek Empire, they took natural hillsides and built them out. They were also one-sided, very much like this, or if you're in... Uh, Southern California, we have uh, the Greek theater, or we even have the Verizon Wireless Amphitheater down in Irvine, and it's very much in this type of setup. What the Colosseum is, is a double amphitheater, and it's the first time we see this. Overall, Rome topography is pretty flat, and so we're not going to have very many areas where we can create a true Greek theater. So we have to literally build the sides up to provide seating for the occupants. This is a building that is also made of concrete, which is really kind of the first time we see this being used. Now, the architects could have used marble, but marble is extremely expensive. So concrete was less cost, and we could also have molds that could be moved around to create this structure. So we don't even need workers 
that have specialization in working marble. Marble was faced on the outside of this building, but I also want to draw attention to how it does give a nod to Greek architecture. At the bottom level, particularly seen at the left in this image, we have Doric columns. The second floor, Ionic columns. The top floor, Corinthian columns. And the seating was depending on your classification in society. The most important people sat close to the arena floor. The next level would be the senators, the wealthy businessmen, then the freeborn citizens, and finally at the highest level, women, slaves, and non-citizens. And look at how well organized it is as well with each of these entrances being marked by Roman numerals. Besides having the gladiator fights here, you would also have wild animal hunts and executions of criminals. The floor would be filled with sand and sand would be easier to clean up the blood from. What's also unique about this structure is that this is built on what was a lake. So again, we see the Romans conquering nature, and Rome particularly is a pretty marshy area. A lot of people died from malaria, and even the buildings themselves, these early buildings fall into disrepair, not because they were built poorly, but they didn't know about soil tectonics. So a lot of the buildings that were built during the Roman Empire didn't survive, not because of time or warfare, but because they were built with poor foundations. And it was only a few years where a lot of these buildings would start beginning to lean out of true. So unfortunately, that's why a lot of these buildings don't exist anymore. We're gonna take a look at Mount Vesuvius and its destruction, which happened on August 24th in the year 79 AD. I do have a video that has been uploaded onto our website, and I also have the link in the description box below this video that you should play right now. It does take about 10 minutes, so I did not include it into this presentation, but it is really kind of cool to see the time period in which this volcano erupted. Pompeii was, of course, found in the 1700s, along with Herculaneum. And when we start to see the excavation in archaeology regarding these civilizations, we have a renewed interest in the past. And when you take a Survey 2 class, we'll talk about the neoclassical era. And the neoclassical is all about bringing the ideas of Greece and Rome to present-day France. And I will show you a quick video um, through this presentation about the baking of bread. So it didn't turn out to be as easy as we thought to reproduce this bread. But uh, here we are. We got some flour, and we got some buckwheat flour, which was the flour that they use all the time. It was more ready available. So we're gonna got a kilo of that, so like two pounds, and uh, we prepare a fountain. And here we got a little bit of the as we call it in Italy, maga or biga or, you know, because obviously they didn't have yeast as such. 
but they will use like a sourdough as we call it now. Okay? Lovely smell of acidity. And there you go. There you go. And then here I got a little bit of water. It's got a bit of salt in it. And I'm going to gently with my hands. Apparently they were using as well some kind of different animals to move around different machines that mix the bread but obviously being wood nothing was left over from it slowly I put it all in and I go in the middle Okay, I'm gonna work it really gently, yeah, and try to allow it to turn always a little bit of air. So it gets trapped in there, so it makes it nice and lighter. As you can see, it's a very straightforward dough, and very well stratified, and really, really nice. So I'm going to shape it down like that, and. ready to go and then we're gonna press it up okay so here I got the right shape sides and uh, the only thing I had to let it raise for a minute I think one hour and a half to two hours would be more than enough in the temperate room there we are got one one hour and a half two hours and it gets much softer and you know this is where I start to have a problem because in a normal situation, I would bake this one and it would become a beautiful, I can make little cuts to make it a little bit more. But here, on the picture that I got here, the bread is divided like if it was, it was like a, a token, like it's, it's almost like somebody gets paid one piece of that. So, and there is this sort of like line around, which I cannot justify myself. I, at the start, I thought it was baked upside down or something like that. But obviously it's not, because otherwise they would have found the tin in the oven. So the only thing that I sort of thought about it it could be then, in order to make it easy to carry, they would have baked it with a piece of string around it. And I'll show you what I pulled. So I'll put the string, as I'm going, I'll fix it in. This also will guarantee the fact that each of the pieces of bread will be roughly the same size, because the string will be the same size. Okay, here we are. I'm going to pull it. That's it. I'm happy with that. Okay, now shape is perfect. I'm going to make the cuts. Okay, I'm going to make, I'm going to divide it in eight. One, oops, one, and eight. Eight of these lovely little cap will allow the heat to come up, will allow the thing to raise. But then, as we can see in the picture, each of the slaves had his own little mark. So we make we made a little Locanda Locatelli sort of double L, which you're gonna place here. Now that like in our logo and then a little weight on top of that now i will double this up like that and when the bread is ready i can actually carry it through this string so i'm ready to bake it now
Okay, we're going to take away our LL. And this is making for a fantastic loaf of bread from Pompeii. Alright, so that was a pretty cool video seeing how that bread was baked and created. We're going to move on to the High Empire now, and here we're going to be meeting Emperor Trajan. The artwork that you want to associate with this emperor is the Column of Trajan, which sits in the Forum of Trajan. And a couple things to note with this image is, first of all, the sculpture at the very top is St. Mark. And this is a sculpture that was set there during the Renaissance. It was not original to the column. Most likely, it would have been a sculpture of Trajan. And as we saw with what happened to Greek sculpture that was made of bronze, it was toppled or stolen and melted down and repurposed. So again, not the original sculpture. I also want to direct you to the base as well because the base of this column sits well below the current street level. What's happened over the centuries is that the street level has continued to rise. So you're looking at about a 10 to 12 foot difference between the ancient Roman Empire streets and the current present day Roman streets. The base of this column was originally a tomb. And also when you enter it, there is a staircase that goes up and uh, around the circumference of this column. The image that you see on the outside is in low relief and it shows the emperor's campaigns against the Dacian Empire. Trajan's going to appear 59 times in this narrative and the bottom of the column shows the beginning of the war and then it continually wraps around like 22 times to the ending of the war. One of the more famous scenes is this one, which you see individuals building a fortification around the city. At the very bottom, there's this kind of uh, Poseidon-like figure. This is a personification of the Danube River, and this is where the conflict began. And then we're going to go on to the Emperor Hadrian. And he was the one who was responsible for creating one of my favorite works, which is the Pantheon. Now, do not confuse, especially on an exam, the Greek Parthenon with the Roman Pantheon. Two different civilizations, two cultures, hundreds of years apart. However, I will agree that the very front of the works look very similar. I also have a supporting video I would like you to watch. It's again about nine or ten minutes long, all about the Pantheon. But I'm going to cover some of the most important things about it right here in this video. The first thing I would like you to know is that this is the best preserved of all the ancient Roman buildings. And it looks very much from the front like a Greek temple. Here's a better image of it here. And we can see the colonnade, though, has the Corinthian columns, absolutely denoting this as a Roman structure. And there would have been buildings surrounding this courtyard area here, so we wouldn't be able to see the drum of the building that's behind. So you enter into what you think is a rectangular Greek structure, and you end up in a circular room. And so here's the Pantheon from above. That is called the oculus or eye that is in the center of the dome. It is the only light source for this building. And yes, when it rains, it does rain inside the Pantheon. The dome itself is five feet thick. It is made completely of concrete. So there are no windows along the perimeter because we need the thickness of that building to hold up the heavy dome. 
the building's walls are 20 feet thick. And remember when we talked about the arch, and I told you it revolutionized architecture. This is an arch turned 360 degrees to make that dome or hemisphere. And this is the largest uninterrupted space in the ancient world. It is 140 feet across, and it's also 140 feet tall. So it is perfectly spherical on the inside. Now, when you get to a Survey 2 class and we look at the building of the dome on the uh, Florence Cathedral, that dome then becomes the largest uninterrupted space in the world. And it's about 144 feet across, four feet wider than the Pantheon. And so I'll just show you a few images of the Pantheon. Uh, you can definitely see up above the fake windows up above, we've got the pediments that are very common on Roman uh, structures. Each of these niches is kind of uh, showing you one of the gods. And this is also where you're going to find the grave of the famous Renaissance artist Raphael. And there it is there. Keep in mind, this is also the time where we see the mummy portraits being created. Uh, the Roman Empire has kind of reached its largest extent and definitely reigning over parts of Egypt. And then we'll move on to Marcus Aurelius. This is his bronze equestrian sculpture here. We're not exactly where it originally stood. This was a work that was recovered, and it is the largest equestrian sculpture to survive from antiquity, which is really sad because Rome would have had a tremendous lot of these types of sculptures, and they served as inspirations for later Renaissance artists such as Donatello. Marcus Aurelius, is guiding the horse with his left hand on the reins, while his right hand is kind of raised up in a greeting to either his troops or the citizens of the city. The horse also is kind of pulling off to the right, so we have this unity that exists between the rider and the horse. Now we're gonna move into the late empire. At this time, Rome is the most populous city in the world, and it will only be surpassed in the 19th century by London. Art begins its fall into the Dark Ages, though. It begins to revert away from naturalism. So what happens in the history of art is we kind of follow this ebb and flow. So imagine this first part of the course, we've been going up to the first mountaintop, which is the classical age. We've passed through prehistory, the Middle East, the Aegean, the Egyptian, and we reached the pinnacle of Greece and Rome, of how incredibly lifelike they can make their artwork. Now we're beginning our descent into the Dark Ages. Now we're going to come back up to another mountaintop, but not until the 1400s AD when we're in the Italian Renaissance. We also have a time period where tremendous civil wars break out and the Emperor Diocletian decides it's going to be best to divide the power to make the government more stable. And that's where we get this artwork of the four tetrarchs, which is the structure that Diocletian sets up. So we have four rulers. But first of all, when we look at this artwork, it's always bothered me because it is on the corner of St. Mark's Basilica in Venice, and it doesn't look like it goes there, and it doesn't. This is one of those artworks that have been stolen during one of the Crusades. So this is uh, art theft uh, stolen from Constantinople, 
and it lies back here in Venice today. When we look closer at these individuals, these are supposed to be Diocletian, Maximian, Galerius, and Constantius. But we don't know who's who. They're kind of all made from the same mold. The only difference is the Augusti, which are bearded, are on the left, and their arms are holding over to the right shoulders of the Caesars, uh, which are positioned at the right. And even their clothes look the same. And so this is what I mean by art kind of reverting back to the past. Think about the Egyptian ideal that we had, where all the pharaohs, whether they were male or female, kind of looked the same with the way that their body was presented. Everything was ideal. And so now we're going to talk about the Emperor Constantine. And this is the, unfortunately, the very last great building project of the Roman Empire. It's called the Basilica of Constantine. The Emperor Maxentius actually starts this building project. But Maxentius is going to be killed by Constantine in the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. And so when we look back at the Roman Empire, it used to be that the Roman Empire would go out to conquer its enemies like Trajan did with the Dacian Empire. But all of a sudden now with this civil war, we're battling our own people and killing them off. So this building is absolutely grandiose. This is a building that is 300 feet in length. It is 200 feet high. You can see highlighted here is what is called a groin vault which we will talk about in later chapters, but it's where two barrel vaults meet. Barrel vaults are created from arches. So again, this is an extension of the idea that the Romans created the arch. And here's an overlay of what remains of this building today. And found at this site is this gigantic sculpture of Constantine. The head itself on that pedestal is over eight feet tall. And if we figure out what the proportions of these objects, we're looking at a sculpture that would have been 45 feet high. It would have been equivalent to that sculpture of Athena Parthenos that was in the Parthenon. And this is the Arch of Constantine. And this is something that Constantine would never have seen. Constantine had left Rome after defeating Maxentius in that Battle of the Milvian Bridge that I mentioned earlier. He never came back to the city. So as far as we know, he never saw this triumphal arch. And this is also situated right next to the Colosseum, which you can kind of see off to the right there. There were many arches created in Rome, but very few of them exist today. But they are located in strategic areas throughout the city. The arch really is a patchwork of other arches of great leaders from the past. The circular medallions that are on this work come from Hadrian's arch. The upper frieze, that comes from Marcus Aurelius's arch. All the portraits have also been altered to look similar to Constantine. So I'm going to show you a few images of the arch of Constantine. And this is where we're going to end our lecture on Roman art.